Today, we're going to be talking about extracranial SBRT. Um, I believe somebody else is covering lung SBRT as well as uh, pancreas. So today we're going to be focusing on other abdominal and pelvic sites, uh, specifically for liver, adrenal, kidney, and general pelvis. Uh, so we're going to be talking about setup uncertainties and image-guided techniques. So we're going to jump right in and start with setup uncertainties. Uh, so there's a lot of uncertainties associated with how the patient is set up. And the first step to reduce these uncertainties is obviously immobilization. Uh, so we want to be able to reproducibly position patients from one fraction to the next, as well as to help them keep still during the treatment. Uh, the standard, I guess you could say standard positioning and immobilization that we use, um, you have a wing board with the arms up, the, head is, uh, the patient is supine, head holder, then you have a long vacuum cushion, so that's a backlog, a body fix, or alpha cradles, as still used in some places, and then so much under the knees, that's for patient comfort. And this kind of setup with just a vacuum cushion has a mean setup error on the order of five to nine millimeters. Um, this is just a gross setup error. So this is a backlog, and um, this is our conventional immobilization. So this is what we use for just conventional fractionation. So you can see the purple um, marks on the patient. Um, so those are marked ice. Yes? Um, I think the slides are advancing. Uh, Is anybody else seeing the, Ben, are you seeing those slides advance? So we should be on immobilization, and there's a uh, backlog. Yeah, it's, it's actually, I don't know, what I'm seeing is just the first slide kind of stuck on it. Is that, is that anybody else? Okay. I'm Maybe. seeing that as well, Michael. Okay. Me, uh... Okay, now, now, okay, now, now I see you're changing the slides, uh, Hannah. Okay, is it, is it on the immobilization or is it like a delay? Now, now, now it's in presentation mode, so I think you're probably good now. Okay, yeah, I just closed it and reopened it. Okay, yeah. so yeah, we're on just, immobile. Yeah, can, maybe just move a, move ahead, move back a couple slides. Yeah. Okay, here so here we go. So set up uncertainties, immobilization. Um, so we use immobilization, like I said, to reduce intrafraction and interfraction motion. Um, so basic positioning, we have our backlog that's on a wing board with a head holder. Um, arms up and then a foam wedge under the knee. And this is our five to nine millimeter um, mean setup error. Uh, so this is our conventional immobilization for standard fractionation. Uh, so this is the purple marks on the patient. Um, that's our isocenter. And it's actually not particularly good for either localization or immobilization, despite being standard. For a stereotactic immobilization, so here's a body fix bag or a long SCRT bag. Um, it's not intended for localization itself, but it does a good job of immobilizing the patient. So he's not as mobile, not able to rotate or move quite as much as just a traditional backlog. So each immobilization device has an expected uncertainty. So you see, um, this is a backlog, five to nine millimeters, as we said. Uh, body fix that has the top vacuum on it has a reduced setup uncertainty as well as prologue with abdominal compression. So we can set up the patient and have them as immobilized as possible, but we still need to worry about internal motion, especially for um, abdominal and pelvic sites. So this internal motion is both patient and site specific. And it is to some extent independent of patient immobilization. So this is due to respiratory and cardiac motion. Um, you might have stomach and bowel motion and filling. You have rectal and bladder filling. And so we can combat this with a number of techniques that we'll go into a little more detail in. Um, so these are breath holds, um, abdominal compression, and then dynamic gating. So first I'm going to talk about what we do at MD Anderson and then go a little bit into details about the other options. Um, so we talked about immobilization. So this is a standard patient immo immobilization for a SPRT. Um, this particular patient was for a liver. 
so the patient is supine with the arms up in the wing board. Um, we use a long backlog bag and that's indexed to the table with an exact bar. So that helps reduce any rotations of the bag on the table and has it uh, more uh, reproducible couch parameters. If we treat the patient with a breath hold, they'll have an RPM marker block position marked on the abdomen. And then we place our BBs so that the lateral BBs are on the bag itself. And the sagittal BB is on the patient. And this is also tattooed. And so this helps us to make sure that the patient is in the correct position in the bag. There's no soup to in shift. Um, and then we also draw level marks on the patient. So this keeps it the patient from rolling left and right, we can account for that before you even start imaging. So we have the patient set up in the bag and we start taking the scan. So we start with the mini. Um, so we do a mini scan. So this is just a, a short free breathing scan. And we use this to set our marked isocenter. We set this at the level of the target. Um, and this is what we use to mark the BBs then. So we go in the room and mark with the BBs and on the bag. Um, this ensures patient position within the bag is consistent day to day. Um, minimize that soup to end shift. We then do a free breathing scan. So this is your entire relevant anatomy. So if you're doing a thoracic site, you'll want to include the entire lung. If you're um, doing a abdominal pelvic site, you're going to want to include the entire liver for your DVH purposes. Um, if you have just a generic SBRT that doesn't have any motion management you need to take care of, then this is what's going to be your primary data set. So for like a long bone uh, for a bony mat, or if you have a pelvic node that really isn't mobile, um, the free breathing skin is going to be your primary data set. Um, to account for motion management, so this is your adrenals, your kidneys, your pelvis, we do a 4D scan. So we use an on thigh belt because we use a Phillips scanner, it has a good um, integration. We set the pitch according to the patient's respiration rate. Um, so we take the 4D scan and then we reconstruct it and we play the scan in cine mode at the target motion or at the target location and we evaluate the motion of the target itself. So if it's greater than one CM of motion, that's kind of our tolerance. Um, and so in that case, that's when we'll proceed to do a breath hold. If the motion is less than one CM, then we'll treat without breath hold. And just a reminder for your adrenals, your kidney, your pelvis in general, you're going to make a, an average intensity projection or AIP. This is what you're gonna do your disc calculations on. And you're also going to create a MIP or maximum intensity projection and draw contours on the MIP as well as individual phases. Um, so it's your zero through 90%. Uh, for liver in particular though, we skip straight to the breath hold scans. Um, we assume that the liver is going to move on the order of one to two CM. And so we go straight to the breath hold. So for our system, we use variant RPM. Uh, we do have a visual feedback for the patient which is goggles. Um, so we set their breath hold at the time of simulation. So you, you have the RPM block on the patient. You can see the motion with the breathing trace. And you want to set the level just at the top of the tidal breath pattern. So you don't want this to be a deep breath in. You want it to be a comfortably full breath. Um, so this helps make it reproducible. It keeps the patient from moving or arching their back, that kind of thing. Um, and it's like I said, more reproducible from one day to the next, as well as from one breath to the next. Um, we're gonna set our gating threshold, and we want this threshold to be not that large, and this is to prevent a lot of variation between successive breath holds. Anna? Yes. Um, as, so we have them asking questions, is there, is it okay if we stop you while you're thinking, or do you have like a point during your presentation, maybe, maybe like halfway where we could, or maybe like even in this the overviews where you could ask, ask questions about that section? Uh, why don't you just ask so, questions I mean, as they come up? Um, you know, we can address them then, and then if that works. Okay, because th there was one uh, one question, um, and it was. At what phase of respiration do you treat the patient during gating? 
So that would be for dynamic gating. And I'll have a couple of slides on that here in a minute, but we don't, um, so we either treat free breathing or we treat during the entire breathing process. And that's for if the target motion is less than one CM or if it's greater, then we treat them with breath hold. So you'll see this threshold. Um, I'll have another slide on it that shows it, but only when they hold their breath in this level will we beam on. Okay. Well, um, would you and if you, oh, sorry, sorry, keep going. <laughs> Um, so I was just going to say, um, so if you do decide to do dynamic gating, then that's going to be just an individual. Um, so if you want to do peak inspiration or peak expiration with for liver or something, you'd probably do expiration. So that's going to be like your 50%. And then you have to choose what duty cycle you want to, you know, balance the motion versus the time on the machine. Right. Do you prefer that we answer questions at the very end? Because that, that is an option. Um, no, I think it's fine. You know, feel free to interrupt. Um, it's easier to answer questions as we go on. Okay, then I'll, I'll in, forgive me for when I interrupt you ahead of time. <laughs> oh, no, it's all good. Is there okay. an, any more questions right now? No, just that one question. Okay, sounds good. All right, so this is our breath hold scan. We set the level. Um, this is RPM system. So if you have a different system, it will probably look a bit different, but the concept should be the same. Um, so we have a CT protocol. This is for liver specifically. Um, so we take two breath hold scans before we administer any IV contrast. Um, we do this to make sure the patient can hold their breath. And then we also kind of have just a backup um, without any IV. And then we also take three to five breath hold scans, depending on how well they hold their breath after that contrast is administered. So if you have a liver met, you're gonna want to wait about 25 seconds between the contrast injection and when you start scanning. So this is your light arterial phase. Um, the same for cholangiocarcinomas, which I'm sure I'm not pronouncing right. Um, so it's a 35 second time delay. Um, and then if you want a venous phase or washout, that's going to be a longer time delay. So for other sites, so for your adrenals or your kidney, um, for your breath holds, we just take three to five successive breath hold scans and we don't use any IV contrast. So then we draw for all these three to five successive scans, we draw our contours on those and we merge them together to create an ITV or internal target volume. Um, so this accounts for the variation from one breath hold to another. And then we select one of these images to be our primary data set and use that for our dose calculations. Um, we'll typically select the one that's kind of in the middle of the motion. You know, if they were holding their breath better on one scan versus another, um, that's what we'll choose as the primary. But in general, it doesn't really matter. If you're not wanting to do a breath hold technique, if you want to treat the patient with free breathing, um, it's a good idea to evaluate if you need to do abdominal compression to minimize your internal motion. So you're going to do your 4D CT with the abdominal compression applied. And the same thing as before. You create your reconstructed um, average intensity, minimum intensity projection for liver or your MIP um, for other sites. And you'll use your breathing phases for contouring as well. So we've seen with, there have been studies that, is, that have shown that we can reduce the motion to less than five millimeters in 93% of patients that had a pneumatic belt. I believe this is a Civco brand here, um, in a muscle relaxant. Um, the mean intrafraction motion for compression alone, or the largest, is going to be the supes to imps direction, and that's 5.7 millimeters. Um, so if we do this, we still need to make um, an ITV, uh, but be sure to apply compression with care. You don't want to make the tumor, marsh, tumor motion increase uh, it basically causes the patient to breathe a little more shallow or it can make them breathe more in their chest. Um, it can also change the patient's shape. So be mindful of this, you know, it's kind of a squishy area of the body. So if you're doing like a PET or an MRI fusion, um, just something to keep in mind. Hannah? Yes. Uh, one question. 
is there is the protocol for pancreas SBRT different? Uh, for the CT protocol, is the is the is the SBRT protocol like for for immobilization compression different for pancreas? Uh, for pancreas, it should be about the same. I am not very familiar with pancreas, to be honest. Um, you probably would want to have like an oral contrast for your sim, but in terms of the setup, the 4D um, breath holder compression kind of thing, it should be similar. Similar to liver. Um, similar to liver. And I think there is a uh, workshop on that this week. Is that correct? Yes. On SCRT pancreas. So hopefully it, it, they'll be able to. Planning, not, not necessarily on setup. It's on treatment planning. Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. No, um, I'm not super familiar with pancreas, but I can, um, I can find out and get back to you all with that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So here is dynamic gating, which I briefly touched on before. So this is where the patient is treated and then the beam is um, basically monitoring that breathing. The beam only is on in certain phases. Um, so there's a lot of details of dynamic gating if you want it to be an amplitude based versus a phase based. Um, and it's kind of a mess to do. Um, you need to select which phases you want to treat in. So this is inspiration versus exhalation, which we mentioned before. Um, the beam only turns on when the marker or surrogate is within the given amplitude or phase range. Uh, so amplitude gating is kind of the easier thing. We see this here. This is at exhalation. So these squares at the bottom is where the beam is on, and where it's at the bottom is where it's off that the beam holds. So this is when the patient is breathing in, the beam holds. When they're breathing out, the beam is on. And it's kind of a more stable, um, there's less motion at exhalation, is why it's typically selected. Um, but there still is some residual motion in the gate. And uh, there is a trade-off between that gate size and the duty cycle of the LINAC, or the time on the table. Um, but be careful if you use dynamic gating because there is a possibility of a phase error. Um, and this is in addition to your bulk setup errors. So the generic errors that are always present kind of is an additional error possibility. Um, and this can cause a geometric miss. So your gated treatment should always be verified each day by gated imaging and your fiducial base setup using a pair of gated KB images. Okay, so this is kind of the breath hold that I mentioned before. Um, so this is our RPM trace. So the patient might be a little hard to see, but the patient breathing is in between the thresholds in, this, in the top picture. So the beam is on. And then when they, they're normally breathing, they're not within that threshold, so the beam is off. So we want to basically predict what kind of uncertainties we're going to have at the machine. and try to limit those. So this is basically what we just talked about. We want to anticipate the intrafraction tumor motion. So respiration motion, which system you're going to use to monitor, any bowel motion or bladder filling, and then we want to avoid a geometric miss. You also want to properly anticipate interfraction tumor motion. So this is from one day to the next. Um, so there's going to be some internal motion with respect to your bony landmarks. Um, we see this a lot with liver, you know, kind of to form and shape, so it might not quite line up to bone the same way. Um, you can try to minimize day-to-day -day variances for some sites. Um, pancreas is one, liver to some extent by treating NPO for, say, three hours beforehand. Um, there's De deformation of tissue compared to simulation for empty versus full stomach, and this can be significant. Um, at our center, we actually track the couch positions daily. So each patient has a little spreadsheet where we record their initial couch position. So that's your marked ISO center. Then we do a bony alignment shift, and then we do a soft tissue alignment shift. And we want to see what that bone to soft tissue alignment is. And for abdominal and pelvic sites, specifically within 1CM, 
Uh, for lung sites, we expect it to be less than five millimeters. For pelvic sites, it can be susceptible to bladder and rectal filling effects, uh, depending on the site and proximity to the bladder and rectum. So we see this a lot with prostate SCRT, which I'm not going to go into a lot of detail in here. Um, but it's easy to manage this, um, have a daily bladder scanner to have your bladder volume be consistent from one fraction to the next. Um, you can use a rectal tube to dispel gas if needed and try to limit the time on the machine so that the bladder is not filling too much while the patient is on the table. So this would be using arcs instead of step and shoot, you know, try to minimize any couch kicks or non coplanar beams, um, and try to basically maximize the output of your machine, use the highest dose rate, or if you have FFF beams. So that's basically the overview of the patient setup, immobilization, and um, managing motion. Are there any questions about that before I go on to image guidance? So again, I'm going to kind of talk about what we do at MD Anderson and then talk about other options as well. Um, so for SBRT liver specifically, we treat all of our SBRT liver patients with CT on rails. Um, and this is kind of a quirky thing that MD Anderson has. So just quickly how it works. Uh, so you have your Linux on one side of the vault and you have your CT scanner on the other side. And the couch is positioned in between them. So the patient is placed on the couch in the treatment position, and then we rotate the entire couch with the patient on it 180 degrees. So the patient is facing the CT scanner. Uh, the CT scanner then comes on its rails on the floor um, and scans the patient. Then we rotate the patient back to the, uh, I'm sorry, that says imaging position. Let's just say treatment position. Uh, shift it according to imaging, and then we treat. So why do we treat all of our patients with CT on rails? Um, in two words, image quality. Uh, so you're, this is a regular CT scanner, so you have improved high resolution image quality versus a cone beam for soft tissue specifically. Increased low contrast resolution, which is very useful for livers in particular. Um, there's reduced image artifacts that are re result of inhomogeneities in the tissue, such as air bubbles and bell. Um, I should say decreased image acquisition time. So a CT scan, it's like 10 seconds versus a whole minute for a cone beam. So this is both easier for the patient if they're doing a breath hold, as well as there's reduced image blurring due to motion. So this is an SBRT liver patient that we treated. Um, so the top panels, as well as the left on the bottom, these are our daily CT images of the patient. And we have some of the contours on. So you can see the body outline and the liver outline. And there's a little bit of a deformation there. Um, this is a target. And then you can also see in the bottom right pane, this is our um, simulation image, our reference image. And it's actually really good image quality. We're able to see this liver lesion pretty easily as well as localize it. But there are some limitations to CT on rails, as with all things. Um, it is specialized equipment, so not many centers have this available, and it also takes up a lot of space in the vault. So it's not like you can just renovate an existing vault, because there probably isn't room to add a CT scanner. Um, we need to correlate the treatment in the imaging ISO centers, and this is actually at a cost of reduced um, localization accuracy. We place fiducials or BBs on the patient, so here you can see the BBs placed on the patient. And this is our ISO center. Um, so this accuracy is on order of one to two millimeters versus for your LINAC, you have a Winston Lutz accuracy between treatment and imaging ISO center of less than one millimeter, typically about 0.5. And there's vendor enforced treatment limitations as well. Um, we don't have KV onboard imaging. We only have a portal imager, so MV imaging only. And then we're not allowed to use VMAT by the license. So we can do step and shoot IMRT, but we cannot do ARC. So other technologies, um, obviously most centers are going to be doing a cone beam CT. Uh, for the liver, it can be difficult to visualize the lesion due to poor low contrast resolution of the cone beam, as I mentioned before. Um, if you can 
use fiducials, that makes it a lot easier to see everything. So you can either implant fiducials or you can use existing surgical clips if the patient is post-op. Uh, for other sites, it's pretty easy to see kidneys. Um, adrenals are just sitting right on top of them. Um, pelvic nodes are pretty easy to see as well. Um, you just have to be careful of any imaging artifacts. So if there's any bowel gas that kind of causes a streaking artifact or high Z material that can have a pretty bad effect on cone beam. Uh, there's been a lot of recent advances in onboard imaging for motion management. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about the very improving platform because they have a lot of good advances lately. I do have a little disclaimer here. I don't have any conflicts of interest with Varian. I just am most familiar with them. So I'm sorry you have this biased perspective, but it's just my experience. Um, so the Truvian platform though has the um, CBCT acquisition is actually improved over previous Linux and that the KV detector plane actually moves during the, the cone beam acquisition to account for the balancing of the gantry itself. And so this improves your CBCT image quality directly. Uh, with the platform 2.7 for Truving, there's also a number of specific um, respiratory devices or software, I could say. Uh, the first is a gated cone beam. So the cone beam acquisition only occurs while the patient's respiration is within the set gating window. And this is integrated, the gating is integrated with the uh, treatment module. Uh, you can use this for free breathing as well as breath hold patients. Um, this reduces motion artifacts, obviously, so you have improved visualization of soft tissue targets. Um, make sure that your target is within that planned ITV, um, but it does require you to have that respiratory motion management system. <clears throat> so here's an image. Um, this is provided by Varian. So you can see a traditional 3D cone beam CT on the left versus a gated one on the right. So you see much less artifacts and streaking that are due to that motion. There's also a short arc cone beam CT, and this is useful for breath hold patients specifically. So this is, instead of it being a full arc for your half fan, which typically is going to be your um, abdominal and pelvic patients, it's going to be 120 to 150 degrees. So your acquisition time is like 20 to 25 seconds, which for most patients is a single breath hold. So you can see on the top left, this is a 120 degree acquisition versus bottom right is 200 degrees. So you can see the image quality is actually fairly reasonable. Uh, TrueBeam 2.7 also allows online 4D cone beam CTs. Um, it previously was only an offline review option. Um, so this is your full 4D phase based. Um, so you can see the visualization of target and structure motion itself. You can see how your target is moving versus your plans like your ITV or if you have any planning risk volumes or PRVs. Um, this also improves image quality for targets with large motion. Uh, they have a new um, reconstruction algorithm to specifically reduce the streak artifacts. So we see the phase-based correlated reconstruction on the left versus the new reconstruction on the right. Anna? Um, yes. Uh, so we have a question. And the question is, in order to improve resolution in liver SBRT, what protocols do you recommend? To I'm sorry, in order to improve, uh, say that again? In order to improve image resolution, what protocols do you recommend using for Liz, liver SBRT with, with cone beam CT? Um, I mean, you're in large part going to be restricted just by your actual imager. Um, so you should be doing a full scan acquisition, so it's going to be a half span. So that'll be your 360 degree rotation. Um, you can do, so we typically do like a low dose thorax kind of um, 
protocol that Varian has. I can't remember. It's like two and a half millimeter slice thickness, I believe. Um, there's not really much that we can do. It's kind of a lockdown system just based on your detector panel. So you mostly use like the, the presets, just the half fan preset? Yeah, I mean, you can play with it some. You can try, you know, for larger patients, increase your KVP. But in terms of the actual resolution, there's, it's, it's kind of locked down. It's, it's a uh, hardware issue more than, more than anything else. Yeah, that is unfortunately a limit of Sunbeam CT and CT in general. Um, so the electosymmetry, I'm not entirely familiar with, but they do have 4D image acquisition with online uh, reconstruction available. And this is kind of an interesting different system in that it doesn't have gating or tracking. It uses anatomically correlated 4D. Um, so you don't have an external surrogate, like a marker block or um, breath hold level. It's an anatomically gated or correlated. Okay, so after we take our cone beam, what do we do? Um, so your cone beam is done, you do your match, you make the shift, um, then you take a planar KV or MV to verify the location of any fiducials or bony landmarks versus your plan. So this is kind of why we record that soft tissue versus bony alignment, that shift between them. So we can kind of make sure that our bones are, if we say it's a three millimeter shift from bone, we make sure it looks correct. Um, depending on what you're treating. If you're treating with free breathing, like with abdominal compression, you should probably take a fluoro um, to verify that your fiducials are within that ITV. Uh, the fiducials should be contoured on all phases. And if you don't have any fiducials for liver in particular, you can use the dome of the liver to act as a proxy. It's kind of a rough approximation. It isn't the most optimal option. Um, just make sure to contour the maximum extent for inhalation and exhalation and make sure that the breath level is in that contour. Um, so after your pretreatment imaging is complete, then you want to beam on. But how do you account for unplanned motion during treatment? So this is kind of one of these questions that we're still trying to wrap our heads around and account for. Um, so if there's any patient motion, patient motion, uh, changes in breathing, any bladder or rectum filling, um, are you going to repeat imaging between your arcs or fields? Um, so basically we say, well, we're going to assume that the patient motion and any changes in breathing, if the patient relaxes, that's going to be taken into account by our mobilization. Any bladder or rectum filling, this is actually a very big issue for prostate SBRT. Um, but basically, aside from prostate, we don't do any intrafraction imaging at MD Anderson, but this is your clinical judgment. So this is where you make that decision. If you do decide to do additional imaging between, um, between arcs or beams, um, you have to decide what you're going to do as well. So you could repeat the cone beam, but that's increased time on the table. Um, it's just kind of a long acquisition time for minimal gains. So if you took your KVs or MVs after your cone beam before, you should know where your bony landmarks or your fiducials are. So you can just take another set of them and verify that position versus your pretreatment KV pair. So if you do like an orthogonal KV pair, it's fast, it's easy, it's low dose. Um, so you can either use the onboard imaging with your Linux, or you could have an external system, such as ExactTrack. Um, this is what we use for prostate SBRT. Um, and we typically have one to two millimeter shifts. So we take snaps, they're called. We take snaps after each arc and also final at the end of each fraction. Uh, you could do an MV KV pair with onboard imaging. So there's no motion of the gantry, so it's very fast, but you have that increased dose from your MV beam. Um, it also has reduced image quality due to its higher energy. 
or you could do a triggered imaging technique, which is kind of at the forefront of intrafraction imaging. Um, so it's basically a single KV image that's taken at regular intervals during the treatment delivery. So it doesn't add any time because you take it while the beam is on. It's low dose, it's KV image, and you can trigger based on the breathing motion of the patient. So if it's a gated patient, you can take it at every expiration or inspiration. Uh, you could take it with every elapsed time. So you could say every 10 seconds, take a KV. You could do it with MUs delivered. Um, so every 100 MUs or whatever you would find clinically relevant or every gantry angle, so like every 10 degrees. Um, so this requires a decision threshold though. So you're taking these images during treatment. At what point do you interrupt your treatment to make your shift? Do you say if it's a one millimeter shift, you continue treating. If it's a two millimeter uh, shift, then you interrupt and make that shift and then continue. Um, so this is a decision threshold um, that you individually would have to make. Um, there are other patient monitoring options. These kind of tie back into that patient motion again. Um, so there's optical and surface monitoring. So that's OSMS or Vision RT. Um, implanted beacons like Calypso is more useful for pelvic sites. Um, I think we've pretty much covered them all. So I'm just going to summarize what we've talked about here. So we started with our setup and localization uncertainties. Um, immobilization is your first step. Um, you need to have good immobilization. Um, then you need to quantify that target motion. So if you're treating with a gating technique, if you're treating free breathing, if you're treating with breath holds, the variation from one breath hold to the next, you need to quantify this at your simulation and then account for this motion accordingly. With your margins or creating an ITV, um, if you see a lot of motion, you might want to increase your margins. Um, you need to verify that target motion at the time of treatment for each fraction. Uh, for imaging, so at simulation, make sure you do appropriate imaging. So this would be a 40 CT or a breath hold, um, depending on your clinic and your site, using IV contrast to help um, identify liver met. At the time of treatment, fiducials are helpful in localization. And then intrafraction imaging, as I just mentioned, uh, it's not necessary, but use at your discretion. I think that's about all that I have. If you have any more questions at this point, hopefully I can answer them. Maybe just give it a sec, because they they usually type the questions into the chat box. OK. Entonces, si alguien tiene una pregunta, lo pueden hacer en este momento en inglés o por el chat box, como quieran. Uh, la función de symmetry es suficiente para poder hacer SBRT de hígado sin fiducials. A ver, ¿puedes repetir la pregunta un poquito más lento? Oh, preguntaba si la función de symmetry es suficiente para poder hacer SBRT hepático sin fiduciales. Symmetry. ¿A qué te refieres con la función simétrica? ¿Te refieres a cuán simétrico es el campo? No, Symmetry es una función que tienen las máquinas de Lecta para poder hacer eh, un 4D cuando se verifica la imagen. Oh. Hannah, are you familiar with the symmetry system on Electa machines? Uh, not very much. I think I had one slide. I've never used it, um, so no, I'm not familiar with it. I've just read some about it is all. O sea, no, no estamos familiarizados con este sistema de symmetry, lamentablemente. Ah, Hannah, what are you? What usual doses do you do for your SBRT cases? Ooh, so we have a lot of clinical trials that go on here. So we have a lot of variation. 
Uh, for our livers, we've been doing a lot of 10 fraction regimens. So it's more of a hypofractionation than SBRT. So we can do six gray times 10 or seven gray times 10. Um, I think the typical dose fractionation is about 10 gray times five, I believe, or nine gray times five. Um, but the only ones that I've been doing are on protocol. So they're that 10 fraction regime. Do you have some examples out of protocol? Like just general uh, practice that they might benefit to hear from? I'm sorry, say that again? Sorry, I wasn't mute. <clears throat> Do you have some other fractionations that are not on protocol that probably are TOG recommendations that it might be beneficial for the audience? Oh, that is pulling at the back of my memory. Um, <laughs> since I've been at MD Anderson, um, so I'm only on the GU and GYN sites, so we don't get patients that aren't on protocol, essentially. Right. Um, sorry, I put you in the spot. Yeah. yeah, no, I'm sorry, I just cannot remember. Lo que la presentadora dice es que en la institución donde ella, donde ella está, tiene muchos pacientes que están en en estudios uh, particulares, así que a veces dan de seis grays en tres, did, did you say ten grays in six fractions? Or in, uh, in ten gray times five fractions, a okay. fifty gray total, is that right? So, ellos dan en, en la institución donde ya está a uh, seis, a uh, diez grays en seis fracciones. Hmm. And another question, how do you handle lesions that are close to the hepatic portal vein? So that's a good question. Um, so the portal vein, um, so you don't want to have circumferential radiation of it, right? So you're going to put just a limiting structure there to limit the dose. And there's typically going to be like a five millimeter to one CM would create a PRV or planning risk volume. And so basically just limit the dose to that PRV. Right. Um, another question is, do you typically have to educate the patient on how to, how, how you're going to do the immobilization process with, with, uh, with like breath hold and then the compressor? Do you kind of like talk them through it? Yeah. So that's actually a big part of the success of doing a breath hold with the patient is kind of talking them through it. Um, so we have a visual feedback that helps them also. So they actually see in those goggles, let me go back, they actually see this little blue bar and it turns, so the yellow bar is their breathing and then it turns green when it's inside the blue. So they have that visual feedback and we also talk them through it so they kind of understand what's going on so that they can breathe um, in a reproducible manner. Um, you know, make sure they're not breathing too much in their chest, make sure they're taking, you know, steady, even breaths, and that visual feedback is key as well. Is there anything else you tell them about, apart from the gating and the compressor and compression? Um, I mean, we typically just walk them through everything, like you would any other patient, right? So, you, you know, you are setting them up, you want to make sure they're comfortable, tell them, you know, they're going to be lying in that position for a long time, walk them through the whole breath hold, and, you know, it's important to breathe uh, consistently so we can get a good CT for the 4D. Um, you know, we try to just explain everything as we're doing it. Um, tell them on the machine, tell them when we're doing imaging, tell them when we're about to start treating, um, you know, just try to, try to keep that communication open. But in terms of the education, I think the, the breathing is is important also you know if they're going to be npo or something then talking you know educating them about that as well okay, okay uh two two other questions the first one is <clears throat> do you know of any studies that compare the toxicity of treatments between uh, for for liver for liver sbrt between cyberknife and uh, linear accelerator um, based treatments like with uh, like linear accelerators with uh, 
compressors versus CyberKnife with their motion tracking system. Are you aware of any of those studies that compare them? You know, I'm not familiar with them. I've not worked on CyberKnife, so it's not something I've kind of delved into. Um, I would imagine, though, with, with the tracking of the CyberKnife, if you have, you know, your fiducial system well-placed, then it's going to limit the, so you're going to be able to have smaller margins, so it's going to limit the healthy liver um, or healthy tissue that you're having to irradiate. Okay. Um, but I'm not familiar with any direct studies now. Okay. Um, does MD Anderson have uh, uh, information on SBRT uh, liver metastases that are operatable? Oh, um, you know, I, I'm i not sure, to be honest. Um, I think we typically get patients that are inoperable because um, we're kind of their last resort. I don't know that we've treated anybody that opted for radiation instead of surgery. Or maybe, maybe the question is more, do you treat, do you do treatment of sites after operation, after, after? Um, oh, okay. So post-op, like a resection cavity? That may, that may be more what they're asking. I'm trying to. Okay. Um, so only if there's like a recurrence. I don't think we've done like a cavity, but you know, if there's, if there's a recurrence, then that's something that we could do. Eso fue tu pregunta, Juan, más o menos. Uh, sobre todo era si tenían experiencia en irradiación de lesiones que sí son resecables, pero con que se han, que han recibido ese BRT, ¿no? En vez de ser operadas. Yeah, ellos solamente hacen uh, lesiones que no son opera, operables. Mm 